24. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. This is the France 24 debate. We're looking at the fallout of the revelations of U.S. intelligence whistleblower Edward Snowden. We're talking about it with, from New York, attorney Chase Madar, author of The Passion of Bradley Manning, the story behind the WikiLeaks whistleblower. Here in the studio, we're joined by Ellen Wasselina of uh, the Experts Council, a geopolitics uh, uh, consultancy group, right. uh, and also a member of Republicans Abroad. Also with us, Martin Michelot of the German Marshall Fund. Uh, Marcus Kerber, who teaches political economy at Technische Universität in Berlin. And uh, we uh, were talking about Edward Snowden, what effect it's had, how much of an impact it will have in the long run. When the scandal first broke, uh, this was a month ago, rebuttal came from the U.S. president himself. I think it's important to re recognize that uh, you can't have 100 percent security and also then have 100 percent privacy and zero inconvenience. Uh, you know, they, 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 we're, we're going to have to make some choices uh, as a society. We're going to have to make some choices. Um, the uh, part one of our discussion, Marcus Kerber was retracing how um, the history of how we gather intelligence has evolved a lot since uh, since World War II. Uh, but September 11th was a turning point. Less than two months afterwards, Barack Obama's predecessor signed the Patriot Act, giving law enforcement agents in the U.S. a much wider remit in gathering intelligence, monitoring financial transactions, and also the deportation of suspect um, individuals. Ellen Wasselina, will history say that that was kind of an original sin in one way, in terms of now it seems like a system that's a little bit out of control? Well, you know, I think we forget, and I would like to remind our viewers too, that the United States was attacked. And, and I think we forget, we tend to forget that, you know, this overstep in intelligence or spying, or whatever you want to call it, uh, has protected the nation and was necessary to intervene, although we must obviously realize that, uh, and I've seen some quotes, that the Constitution was put aside uh, to uh, prevent, and we're talking about crisis prevention or prevention of terrorism. And again, we can ask ourselves too, is, is terrorism as important to all the other countries that are allies in this endeavor, in this sharing of information, or is it just the U.S. Uh, is it just their, their torch to carry? Uh, and I would say that the U.S., of course, has participated, as you know, since, you know, after the Second World War, is in, in keeping the peace and the prosperity in our democratic allies. But countries. is it a little bit out of control now? Have we gone too far? Did we go too far at one moment in our history? And we can look back at Vietnam and different other uh, battles that the U.S. has fought. I, I'm looking at the Patriot Act. I, I know you're looking at the Patriot Act, but I think you have to put it into context. All right, uh, Chase, the, Chase Madar, your thoughts. First, I'd like to say that I am an American. I'm a New Yorker who was here on September 11, 2001. I don't need to be reminded of those attacks. I think the Patriot Act was not uh, an appropriate response. I think it has not added anything to our real security. And we should always remember that it is the American response to 9-11 that has killed close to triple the number of Americans as died on that terrible day in September. Triple the number of Americans have died in Iraq and in Afghanistan. If we add the number of foreign civilians and soldiers who have died, the, the, the order of magnitude is far higher. Uh, I'd also like to point out that the primary Republican author of the Patriot Act, Republican James Sensenbrenner has repudiated what the NSA has done. He is far to the left nowadays in this respect to President Obama. I think things have clearly gone out of control. Not only have they gone out of control in spying on people, but there doesn't seem to be any clear security benefit to Americans and God knows not to Europeans either from this incredibly intrusive level of surveillance and snooping. Now, I want to make clear, nobody is expecting 100% privacy all the time. There should be wiretaps that are legally controlled and precisely targeted. But this is not what we are talking about with this NSA surveillance. 
which is a huge dragnet and really intrudes on, on the freedom of, of millions of people. To say that it's uh, just a matter of privacy being infringed, I don't think captures the, the real magnitude and the horror of what's going on. Activists mobilizing uh, over this issue uh, with online petitions on Facebook pages, such as uh, one we can show you now. It's called Restore the Fourth, and that's in reference to the U.S.'s Fourth Amendment, which introduces um, the notion, we try not to get too much into legalese here, of probable cause before authorities can issue a warrant to search someone's home or personal effect. There you see there's the Fourth Amendment appearing on your screen, um, which can brings we, us... Can uh, we make this a little bit more a, a European, a transatlantic debate? Otherwise, it's just an American-American debate. <laughs> Let me bring in a, a European uh, point of view uh, uh, with a very Western touch, of course. Um, I, I do consider uh, two things to have been said, or, uh, necessary to be said. First of all, uh, there was an overreaction after uh, uh, September 11. Um, on one hand, I fully join Henry Kissinger when he said we have too long neglected combating terrorism. That is true. Mm -hmm. And we have subcultures of terrorism that develop all over the world. We reacted to that. History will judge whether the Afghanistan has become a secure country. I have my doubts about that. Mm -hmm. but at least I join Henry Kissinger fully mm -hmm. uh, in his analysis. We had, we had omitted something. Uh, secondly, uh, the measures taken were not only the Patriot Act, to which you refer, were not only disproportionate, they were inappropriate, because they have not contributed essentially, on a homeland basis, to the security of the average American. And I think we have to discuss in the family, in the Western family, very openly and very radically, with radical openness, uh, about this American obsession of being menaced. Uh, America is a country which has never been attacked, apart from Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. and Pearl Harbor was more or less far away. I, I fully understand that uh, uh, while the destruction of the Twin Towers is, is a trauma, uh, it, it's a nightmare, it's unacceptable, and I feel pity for the people who died in there, but this American obsession has to be dealt with, because otherwise the reaction to that, the Patriot Act, the Home uh, Security oh, Measures, uh, are, are going to create another nightmare. Uh, and and uh, I think we have to make choices, as Mr. Obama, who I'm, whom I criticize very severely in many matters, we have to make choices. There is not 100% privacy and liberty and not 100% so security. What, what and I in, prefer in, personal in freedom. Career. We cannot have 100% uh, security. We have to take the risk of, uh, of, of weighing up freedom, which weighs more than 100% security. So those who want 100% security are ready to sacrifice too much privacy, and not only privacy, individual freedom. Individual and if freedom. we do continue that, we will leave, we'll give up the credo of the free world. All right, how much, how much uh, of a measure uh, do you give up of one or the other? Well, that brings us to our Media Buzz segment. We can say hello to uh, James Creedon. How are you, sir? Evening, Francois. Um, just to pick up a little bit on what you were saying a moment ago about these movements in the U.S. that are from a, perhaps a grassroots level up, trying to restore civil liberties. Uh, you mentioned the Restore the Fourth movement. Um, they have been, that there was a big um, gathering of people in 50 cities across the US for the 4th of July to draw attention to that exact issue. So the 4th of July was used, I think, by this organization to, to draw attention to uh, the issues that we've seen through the NSA um, story. Also, um, a more established organization, um, this is the, uh, the Civil Liberties Union. They've released a video today, uh, Francois, um, uh, featuring um, none other than, if I could remember his name, Oliver Stone. And he has been obviously an outspoken critic of uh, breaches of civil liberties all along. And this is no exception. Let's take a listen to what he's saying. Essentially, his message uh, is, do we control our government or does it control us? OK, we appear not to have that thought, unfortunately. Um, let me see. Can we see if we can get some audio on saw it here. Okay, we don't have that saw, but essentially what he's saying The joys is, of live television. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that, 
American freedom, Amer American independence was based on the reaction to the British government being too present in uh, the day-to-day -day decisions of American people. There was the revolution, the British government was, over, was overthrown in, in US governance and that we have to, it's a constant battle to maintain those freedoms and uh, essentially he's saying contact your congressman. All right, it's kind of what we're seeing again with the whole SOPA PIPA debate that we saw last year about so there's uh, a, there's internet a freedom. Again, people, you know, there's this encouragement, contract your con congressman and insist on your freedoms. And, and as Marcus Kerber was saying a minute ago, this isn't a conversation that only Americans are having. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. It, it, but I suppose that there's such a focus on the NSA debate uh, that I, I think the issues that come up in, within the US debate are relevant to, to France, where actually there's been, there's been much less of a public debate, even though the issues are the very same. Mm -hmm. uh, but so perhaps a lot of people who have these uh, considerations or these concerns are, are sort of perhaps expressing them through the American debate, uh, through the personage of uh, Snowden. But uh, it remains, I think, relevant for European countries as well. All right. Thanks for that, James Thanks, Green. Francois. And uh, we'll, we'll see you for another edition of Media Buzz later on. Absolutely. Um, we were, were talking there uh, a moment ago uh, uh, about uh, the European reaction. And uh, as uh, Marcus Kerber uh, was perhaps uh, hinting at, the outrage uh, has been nowhere more palpable than Germany, where, according to polls, favorable opinion of the United States um, has been plummeting. Um, Der Spiegel came out with, uh, with a cover story about this uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, weeks ago. But now, th that News Weekly coming out with a new cover, showing that, well, hmm, Berlin is cyber snooping too. Uh, the outrage is great in a nation that remains uh, haunted by the notorious East German secret police, the Stasi. And that's obliging Chancellor Angela Merkel, who once again is on the campaign trail, uh, to react. The US president took our worries and concerns very seriously. I made very clear that the espionage of institutions within the European Union is not acceptable among friends. We are not in the Cold War anymore. We're not in the Cold War anymore. We heard Marcus Kerber in part one of our discussion say he felt that the reaction was timid and ineffectual at this part. It's totally hypocritical, this reaction. Martin Michelot, were you expecting more from the German Chancellor? No, I wasn't expecting more. I was expecting just this, just in the same way I expected just this from the French Ambassador Rifkin. Would you have liked to have seen more? I'll rephrase the question. No, no, I, I, no. I, don't, think, I don't think more would have been necessary. I actually think it would have been counterproductive Why? To, to what the transatlantic actors are actually trying, trying to achieve through this, which is a new way to combat terrorism. Uh, the U.S. has given clear responsibilities to Europe to combat terrorism, there is a new division of labor that exists within the transatlantic partners, within with which the, the French, the the British, the Germans are asked to go but in Sahel it, in for, Middle forgive East. Forgive me for interrupting, but showing that, like Der Spiegel has, that they're trading a lot of these secrets, uh, doesn't that explain why her reaction has been, shall we say, subdued? Uh, isn't that sort of showing up the fact that really that the, re the reason why she's paid lip service to criticizing the U.S. but can't really go further because, well, the Germans and the French are in on the act. They're, they're doing it themselves, and they're, they're reaping the results from it on a, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. the, the newspaper Le Monde has, uh, has, showed this, uh, has shown this quite clearly. And, of course, it, you know, Marcus has said that it would be, hypocrit it would be hypocritical. Uh, of course it would. Uh, Manuel Valls at the 4th of July uh, party at the U.S. Embassy uh, chided the Americans, saying that this was not the way, the, the way that allies uh, conducted a relationship. But at the end of the day, everybody is paying lip service to the public opinion, to, which is a necessary component of politics. But there is this reality, and there is also the reality that happens every day at the, the French Secret Service headquarters and at the NSA that, had, that is very, very disconnected from the public opinion. Could, could, I, could I just say a word? It's not only a very hypocritical um, uh, reaction by Frau Merkel, but she is uh, profoundly embarrassed because she, she has just given a very hearty welcome to President Obama, uh, mm. praising him as the a most important and glorious uh, ally of the, the, the natural ally of, uh, of Germany, and praising Germany as the most loyal of European allies. In, in of fairness, Rome. when Obama and was she, in, in she, fairness, she when was Obama was in Berlin, she did, when asked at a press conference, criticize the U.S. over this. Yes, but well, take this into to account. She she got the Freedom Medal, one of the most uh, the highest decoration uh, uh, of the United States, and and the person who received the 
Freedom Medal, uh, now uh, feels confronted with a reality, a sad reality, which, uh, which uh, cannot be mastered, be handled by simply paying lip service to the, to the public opinion. There is an outrage uh, and there is an outcry of protest, not only of some people who have found or identified a subject for an election campaign, never forget about that, but uh, there is a real public debate on whether these practices go on. It is of great intellectual quality, and I can only hope that our American friends will follow that. And there's something else at stake. It involves the private sector. First, I'll read you this Facebook comment from Bubakar. Spying and intelligence by the state is n upon the average citizens nothing new. It's just that the state of the art digital technology has made such uh, uh, indispensable information gathering more intrusive than ever before. Um, digital economy uh, going faster than the legislation, a point made uh, by, by Ellen in part one of our discussion. Chase Madar in Washington this week opened those free trade negotiations between the European Union and the United States. Um, a lot of that trade happens uh, through cyberspace now. Is this going to be a dark cloud over the discussions? Is it going to help to focus those discussions? Does it raise the stakes? I think it will have a very small impact on the trade negotiations. Now, there are some Americans who are defending the NSA spying on European powers by saying that it gives Washington and the United States some kind of competitive advantage, which, of course, all countries want. I think that's a bit ridiculous. Uh, our problems, our economic problems and problems with trade policy in the U.S. really have nothing to do with insufficient spying. Or, or really with, with insufficient attention to digital technologies, where the United States remains a leader. However, remaining a leader in these fields is not enough to offset our recessionary unemployment rate now in its fourth year or any of our other structural economic problems. And there's always been spying uh, in, the in, in, in industry uh, between companies, Marcus Gerber. But uh, should there be a cyber wall around Europe? Of course not, and, and that's why I'm so critical, and I express my criticism in, a, in such a radical way, because not only that uh, there will be trouble in the transatlantic family, and we, we leave, uh, forget a little bit, uh, or uh, lose a little bit of the credo to which we should li live up to, but how can we define a strategy of the West, Europe and America, towards China, uh, a country where spying is part of the national strategy, uh, industrial spying, industrial espionage, um, where I, I think we, we have, the, this affair is real, a loss of Western credibility. How can we tomorrow talk with the Chinese in very clear and uh, straightforward language? Uh, they will retort to us, well, well you're going to do the and, same and thing. That's probably what's happening this Wednesday uh, in Washington. Uh, this is a, how, how can we insist on, on them sticking to roots in international trade? How can we talk to them with one voice, uh, if, in as much as they, they have uh, the argument, well, look, look, try to put your own house in order. So yes. it is not only we, we lose our credo, but uh, we are a little bit ridiculous. And that's what I most fear, a, a loss of authority of the West and the world. Ellen Vaseline. I don't think we can lose our authority now. I think that our model of society has been the most successful. There is the American dream. There's not a Chinese dream, for example. Um, I, I think that what we build our societies on, we educate our, our, our students on our, as you rightly said, Francois, our, our advance in, in high technologies, nanotechnologies, the use that we're, you know, we're advancing. This keeps our competitive advantage, and I might say, too, that's thanks to immigration policies, too, and to immigration that keeps our country competitive. However, I would just say that these talks are extremely important, and I think that they can only bring to both the United States and to our European allies and to this transatlantic trade and investment uh, agreement, mm -hmm. something that can help us mm -hmm. get growth. We're both at very low growth. Uh, where is so the growth? So you agree with Chase Mandar, the suspicion will blow over. Well, sure. I mean, it, it was just the timing, as I said in another uh, talk show that I, that I participated in. It's just the timing that is a bit suspicious as it comes up now as Europe and the U.S. are coming to the first stage of economic integration, which requires six steps that the U EU has finally gotten to, or almost, without the political integration. So I, could, I couldn't agree more, because... Uh, uh, the, the issue about uh, transatlantic um, free trade and uh, free investment zone 
is a, such a fundamental issue. Sure. It's not a very original idea, but I think we have come to a point where, where it is becoming sure very, very, very it. serious. And, we'll and we should not leave out of the side that very important issue, sure. which will not uh, uh, totally put aside uh, the great show Mr. Snowden mm. uh, has organized. And we couldn't get away without uh, saying a word about the whereabouts of Mr. Sto Snowden. Um, the, as of this Wednesday, um, still reported to be inside Moscow Airport. Uh, this after a firm offer to hang his hat in Caracas. Venezuela's leftist president saying that invitation goes for all of his Bolivarian neighbors. This is probably the only collective asylum where the territory of various countries of our Latin America are involved in this humanitarian measure. As this young man said, when you are being persecuted by the imperialists, it's best to come here. Chase Menard, where would you like to see Edward Snowden wind up? You know, I hope he gets away to Caracas and leads a happy and productive life there. This idea that Snowden is a threat to the U.S. or has done damage to us is just more of the politics of fear that has been so deeply damaging to the United States and God knows other countries since 9-11. We need to get over that. And to my fellow Americans who uh, see Venezuela as some kind of dagger poised at the heart of Florida, I think they need to take a deep breath and probably grow up a little bit. Martin Michelot. Well, I, I think you know, what we just heard from Nicolas Maduro answers your earlier question as to why we wouldn't want uh, Edward, Edward Snowden in, uh, in France. But uh, of course, I mean, uh, Edward Snowden should, should, find a, should find a safe harbor but there should also there there is also a case to be made at this point for actually stronger cooperation. But he he could come to France without the French president calling the Americans imperialist. Yes, but the French president would, would not do that because of course the French president does not believe that America that the Americans are, are imperialists, but uh, future trading partners, of course. All right, and when Snowden pitched up in Moscow two weeks ago, uh, you could see something of a smirk on the faces of his host. But by last week. The Russians were openly wondering if they'd done the right thing. If he wants to stay here, there is one condition. He must stop his activities aimed at inflicting damage to our American partners, no matter how strange this may sound coming from my mouth. Uh, Ellen, how do you explain that statement? It's a very interesting statement, and there must be some, uh, shall we say, understanding, too, between the U.S. and Russia and why he wouldn't take them, although there's so much information, I think, that could be there for the Russians to gain from. Um, I, I found that backtrack and... It was quite a, a, a smart turnaround on his part because you know, of course, uh, Francois, that um, Russia then joined the WTO last August and are set to set talks with the OECD. So Russia is moving into this. It's not going to be part of Europe. We know that. But there's, you know, there's the Russia, you know, the NATO, Russia Council, etc. If they keep going in a way that's going to pollute relations as well, and I know they're very good relations too with, with Germany, uh, they have all the interest in, in to be in good relations on the right side of the, of the river, shall we say. Uh, Chase Mendar, do you agree? Is that why Vladimir Putin said, well, uh, don't stay too long and don't talk too much? Well, the geopolitics of, of where Edward Snowden is fleeing and seeking refuge are, of course, strange. Mm. And you can see the conflict in, in Putin's speech, the internal conflict in Russia. On the one hand, here's a chance to grandstand a little bit, mm. finally a chance to lecture the U.S. about human rights. Mm. On the other hand, uh, the Russian state does not like whistleblowers or leakers or anyone who questions state authority. Mm. And uh, I, I think everybody knows that uh, we're all grown-ups, so this hypocrisy shouldn't be so surprising. Mm -hmm. All right, one final question, Chase, just before we go. Marcus Kerber mm -hmm. was wondering aloud in part one of our discussion uh, why there isn't more of a debate in the United States. Uh, how much prominence is this discussion getting where you are? Well, not enough, I think, but I was pleasantly surprised to read in the newspapers this morning that still a majority of Americans see Edward Snowden as a whistleblower, not as a criminal. I also want to point out that uh, that the opposition to Edward Snowden in Washington is bipartisan, with both Democrats and Republicans condemning him. So is the support 
for Edward Snowden with the libertarian minded Republicans like Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, but also more liberal Democrats like Ron Wyden of Oregon and Mark Udall of Colorado. And I hope that the freedom loving wings of both parties will learn to cooperate and work together a bit to keep pushing this issue and to scale back the intrusive surveillance that really does and put us one big step closer to a kind of united Stasi of America, which I do not <laughs> want to live in, and I would not want any of my uh, descendants to live in either. And we'll be keeping a close eye on it. Chase Bandar, I want to thank you for joining us from New York. I want to thank Martin Michelot, Marcus Kerber, Ellen Vasilina. Thank you for being with us here in the France and Get debate.